Good morning. Today on Spotlight, part two of our America Vote series on the high stakes race for two open seats on the Michigan Supreme Court. Last week, we introduced you to Justice Kyra Harris Bowden and Professor Kimberly Ann Thomas. Today, meet Circuit Court Judge Patrick William O'Grady and State Representative Andrew Fink, candidates for the highest judicial body in the Great Lakes State. It's Sunday, October the 27th. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is Spotlight. Uh, in a nutshell, why should people put you on the Michigan Supreme Court? Well, thank you for, for having me here. I think when we look at our Supreme Court, what we look at is we have seven justices, and right now we have basically five of those justices that, do not, that were not previously judges and I'm concerned about the court. I've got over 15 years in the trial court, and I really started my trip on service and public service very early on in life as a Michigan State Trooper. Mm -hmm. And you really learn about service when you actually get to meet people in their highest moment of need. And I was able to do that, answering 911 calls with the Michigan State Police as a trooper. And I had such an affinity for the law, I decided to go to law school while I was a trooper, and then gravitated from being with the Michigan State Police to a prosecutor's office and now on the bench for over 15 years in a county courthouse handling thousands of cases. It's nonpartisan, sorta, yeah. but you're nominated by the political parties. In your case, you're nominated by the Michigan Republican Party. So is it really nonpartisan and is that the best way to get our judges? I ran first as a trial judge and I ran on straight on a nonpartisan ticket. And I found that that was a great way to reach out to the voters and basically talk about impartiality and being a judge. There's always, I think that no matter what system you have, there's always an opportunity to improve it. And maybe that's something that we can do in the future for the state of Michigan. Uh, one of the things I do understand though, is regardless of what ticket you came down from, I've been on the bench for over 15 years. I understand what it means to be impartial, what it means to be a judge, and what it means to make sure that all parties are treated fairly, that they're heard and understood, regardless as to what party system you had to go through uh, to get to where you're at to run for Michigan Supreme Court Justice. I've, ju I've done this for over 15 years now on the trial bench. Do you see your role as interpreting the law or making laws? Because certainly that has become a point of criticism with judges, uh, whether it's on the federal level, state level, or even on a local level. Sometimes people say, they're going too far. Uh, that's not their job. Yeah, well, I think our founding fathers made it clear that they wanted the legislative branch to be that first step of creating law, then they wanted the executive branch to approve it, and then they want the judiciary to make sure everybody stays in their lane. And that is to uh, be that gatekeeper that checks and balance over all the branches of government, and that's what a court should do. They should not be legislators from the bench, uh, they should not be activists, they should apply the law as the law is. You should be impartial? Absolutely, you have to be impartial. Imagine if you went to a courtroom, and every time you went to a courtroom, that a judge just did what they believed compared to just following what the law is, you would get an answer from every different courtroom. And that's not what our system is set up to be. It's supposed to be a rule of law so everyone understands uh, that predictability and that continuity of law, if you know it's going to be applied accurately, correctly, and fairly, and interpreted well, that at that point in time, we can go about our normal lives, we, we can conduct our business, we can conduct our personal affairs, and that gives us that predictability and continuity in doing so. All right, we need to take a quick little pause for the cause. We'll come right back with some more questions to Judge O'Grady right after this. I'm talking to Judge Patrick William O'Grady. He, uh, if elected to the Michigan Supreme Court, he will serve in that position until 2028. He's running in the special election against a current justice on Thank the you. Supreme Court. Um, you've gotten a lot of different endorsements, whole page full of them. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone from Ted Nugent to Right to Life. Of the endorsements, which ones are you proudest of? Which ones say the most? about you, you think? Well, you know, you, I appreciate every endorsement. I, I truly think, though, that the best endorsement is every citizen as I go around the state of Michigan that says that they appreciate our campaign, that they understand my background, and they appreciate the fact that I started boots on the ground and all the way through the, up to the court and the bench. I'm Speaker Newt Gingrich, and I want to tell you why I'm strongly supporting 
Judge Bill O'Grady. You know, he's had a long career of enforcing the law. State trooper, prosecutor, circuit judge. And he would be a great member of the Michigan Supreme Court. All endorsements are great. I appreciate the different groups uh, that look at my resume and that look at who I am as a person. And I do enjoy the fact that they've endorsed me. But at the same point in time, I think the best endorsement is when the voters uh, come forward and, and put your name on that ballot and check the box next to it. When you look at the U.S. Supreme Court, perhaps some, one of the most controversial decisions they've made as of late, Roe versus Wade. Yeah. Um, is you, did, did they get it right with their decision? You know, that decision was before the court and it brought it back to the states. And now we have here in the state of Michigan and, and our voters had an opportunity to vote for it as well. I think it's really great that you brought up the topic because I know people out there are talking about that topic here in the state of Michigan. And I think we need to make it very clear that abortion in the state of Michigan is the law. And no matter who you elect, uh, whether it be a newer judge or a more senior judge with an incredible amount of experience on the bench, that that is the law in our state. And a judge can't change it. Only, only the voters can make that decision if they wanted to change that law in the future. Should there be exceptions for rape or incest? Again, that goes back to the voters. You know, as a judge, I simply rule on the law. Whatever the voters uh, choose as the law, whatever the law is, is how the court applies it. I never bring my individual belief system into a particular law. So if there was a law, you know, garnering widgets, I don't bring my belief in as to what a widget would be. As you look back on the 2020 presidential election, uh, was Joe Biden the legitimate winner of that election? As far as I know, uh, that is, he is the president of the United States and he's been so for just under four years. Uh, and he was sworn in. So he is the president of the United States. All right, and you're very comfortable with the decision that was, that was challenged in a lot of different places. Yeah, there's so many different ways that people were challenging it. So it's hard to answer one thing versus another. I'm not uh, up to in all the specific challenges that different people may have had. Uh, but I think the, the most important thing is focusing on today and that is the 2024 race. That is the most important thing that we have uh, in front of us here today in the state of Michigan and all of us as individual voters and also of those of us who are competing on the ballot uh, for this year's election. Who is a judge, uh, dead or alive, that you admire? You know, I, I truly, um, you know, when I was in law school and also as a young judge, I have a couple. Uh, one, I really uh, admire one of our former chief justices of the Michigan Supreme Court, and that's Bob Young. And uh, he was a leader when I was a, a judge going onto the bench. I had some great conversations with him, and I felt that he was a mentor both in his rulings and his way that he addressed us uh, as his judge corps as to how he was going to run the court system when we were there. And I've also had a great opportunity to speak to him many times privately and personally over the years. And so as a Michigan judge, I really think that Bob Young has been a great impact on me as a young judge here in the state of Michigan, and now with over 15 years. And, and he was a Detroiter. <laughs> He's a Detroiter, you got that right. Absolutely well. What are you proudest of as you look back at your career? I was really proud of the opportunities that I've had to serve the great state of Michigan. Uh, it was very competitive to become a Michigan State Trooper, and that's because it's held to a very high regard to be able to serve the great people of the state of Michigan. And that also goes with being elected as a trial judge. Uh, the ability and just the humility that I have and the reverence that I have for the court of being chosen by the people to sit on the bench and to work through all the problems and all the cases with the people, to me, that is the most important thing and the most gratifying in the career field is just the humility that I have of being able to fulfill those positions. It, here as a resident, myself as a, in the state of Michigan, born and raised uh, also in, throughout, throughout the state. Final question, and unfortunately, time's always our worst enemy in these type of situations. Um, what's the biggest thing that you've had to maybe struggle against in your life, in your career, that may give the viewers out there a sense of who Judge O'Grady really is? Well, I've never had anything given to me. I, to me, it was basically a day-to-day -day grind, setting your goals, uh, and then basically working toward those goals. I think it's very easy to come frustrated every once in a while as maybe you're not achieving your success at the pace that you want to. But I think everything has a time and a place. And I look back at my career and each position built on, was a great foundation for the next. 
And that's what I think that when we look at our Supreme Court, we need people to have great foundations. And I would like to be the added value of having over 15 years in the trial court, taking the added value to the court and being really a, a person who's actually been a judge before on our Supreme Court. Judge O'Grady, thanks so much for coming in, sharing your thoughts with our viewers. Good luck on election. Thank you so much for having me, I appreciate it. And up next on this Spotlight Special, I'll sit down with Michigan State Representative Andrew Fink. We'll be right back. Why do you want to move from the legislative branch to the judicial branch? Yeah, there's a sense in which, for me, I look at it as something of a homecoming. You know, my, my career has mostly been as an attorney, first in the Marine Corps, then in private practice, and I've even maintained some of that private practice while serving in the legislature. And so getting back into some kind of a full-time legal role, uh, of course, the legislature writes laws, and, that's, and there, there's a lot of exposure to different areas of law there, uh, but kind of getting back into uh, some kind of lawyering seemed like the right next step for me and ultimately a continuation of public service that has driven my career. Do you think that's going to be a big transition, a big leap going from a body in which you're constantly trying to come up with bills and write laws for the betterment of the people to now a position where in theory you're just supposed to interpret the law? I think it's a great question because it, I do think that it's a major difference between a, the legislator and the judge. Uh, one way to think of it is that the legislature or legislators and even individually can be really entrepreneurial. They can kind of think about, well, what do I want to see happen? What do I want to accomplish? Whereas the judiciary is a little more passive uh, in the sense that it's only when you know, an issue is developed with the law where a matter of interpretation needs to be kind of decided. Uh, that the case should get there, especially up, all the way up to the Supreme Court. Even arguing in the Supreme Court earlier this year, it's a difference in role that I'm very comfortable with and, and I'm, I'm more than able and even excited about the transition. Do you think that the current Michigan Supreme Court, the, the decisions that you've seen them make recently, um, border on overreach? There have been a couple of cases where I'd say uh, I think that the the legal reasoning uh, that you see in these majority opinions is at best strained and in other cases or maybe a, another way to look at it is uh, uh, trying to fit a result into the text that really doesn't fit the text. When the opinion doesn't explain itself in a way that really makes sense from a, a legal or textualist perspective, it does start to raise questions about well, why, you know, how did we get here? when the text doesn't necessarily justify it. I mean, one of the big issues, you know, the tipped wage uh, issue that, that the Supreme Court decided earlier this year uh, is one where it's difficult, I think, to understand that decision from a strictly textual standpoint. Representative Fink, you were nominated by the Michigan Republican Party for this quote unquote nonpartisan position. And could you clearly go to that court and be nonpartisan? It's, it's obviously incumbent upon every judge to uh, act in a nonpartisan way. This is, as far as I know, a unique system for selecting Supreme Court nominees in the whole country. There's, as far as I know, there's no other state that does it this way. And I think raising questions about the process makes perfect sense. But understanding this is the process that we had to go through from the get-go, I emphasized even at the convention stage you know, that I, was, I would tell them, listen, you know, I've got to go and ask 2,100 of the most partisan people in the state to make me a nonpartisan candidate. But having that awareness the whole time uh, has really allowed me to say, you know, my message at, at the convention stage is the same as my message now, which is the courts should, should be there to serve the people and run in a way that, that works for the people. Due process is for everyone, not just insiders. And cases should be decided based on what the law says, not the personal views of the judge. And you're right, the system was in place long before you ran for this position. Uh, but if you had your druthers, would you get rid of this system? Uh, I'll say I haven't made a holistic study of it as I've been running, but as I've, you know, as I've kind of gotten familiar with our system and started to learn about others, I tend to think that the United States Constitution's set, set up of the executive nominating and the Senate either appointing or deciding not to, uh, or you know, confirming or deciding not to confirm an appointment, uh, is probably the best system that I have seen. All right, we need to take a quick little pause for the cause. We'll come right back with some more questions to Representative Andrew Fink candidate for the Michigan Supreme Court. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm. 
What are you hearing from the voters when you're out and about? What is it they would like you to do most on that court? I think it's actually interesting and even inspiring that the most consistent thing I hear is that people want to think that their judges were fair. And of course, the Supreme Court has the responsibility to be fair to the litigants in the cases that are in front of them, but also to make sure that the lower court system is run efficiently and fairly for all litigants. Everybody understands that if you litigate a case, you know, if a court decides a case, there's a winner and a loser pretty much all the time. And of course, in some senses, everybody loses something if you go to court because it's expensive and stressful and all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but you don't want people to walk away from the courthouse, even if they've lost, believing that they weren't at least heard by the court. You know, that's really what the due process clause of our Constitution protects. It's not that you get the result you like, but it does mean that you should have the same opportunity to have your case heard as everyone else does. I'd say that's the most consistent thing I hear. If elected to the Michigan Supreme Court, is there anything particular you'd like to do in that position to make this a safer society than what we currently have? The courts do play an important role in public safety. You know, my grandpa and my uncle were both district court and my uncle is circuit court judge in Washtenaw County. My dad's a retired Washtenaw County Sheriff's officer. Uh, and so I've seen kind of the way in which the court system and thought about the way in which the court system contributes to public safety. Uh, but of course, that's at the same time, we just talked about due process, respecting the rights of uh, everyone involved, whether it's the victims or even the, the defendants themselves until they've been found guilty. Uh, but taking that, that public safety role seriously and, and certainly not looking for ways to avoid uh, those convicted of crimes from uh, uh, facing the consequences of their actions, I do think that's an important role that the court needs to play. Sure. If people watching this program go to your website, uh, your campaign website, they will see a ton of endorsements. If there are one or two that you're proudest of because you say that endorsement says a lot perhaps about me and my philosophy yeah would it be? Uh, let me say two uh, the first the police officers association of michigan endorsed me the reason that i think that's important is because those are the guys I mean, that's a union those are the guys that are out on the street mm -hmm. uh, uh, trying to provide safety i should say guys and gals uh, you know mm -hmm. police officers all across the state my dad was a police officers association of michigan member when he was a a policeman uh, and so Taking that, uh, that role seriously, I mean, that, there's a little bit of kind of uh, putting my money where my mouth is there in the relationship I've built there. Uh, a second one I'd, I'd like to emphasize in addition to those that, that you've said, and I mean, there's like 50 prosecutors on our endorsement list too, so there's, there's a lot to potentially choose from. But the NFIB, the National Federation of Independent Businesses, these are the truly small businesses who are seldom going to be really the, the, anything but the little guy in any kind of a scrap that they might have but they know that their case would again be fairly heard if I were on the Supreme Court. Uh, and so that, those are uh, two groups that I think really demonstrate that it's people that are kind of out there, you know, working for a living, uh, trying to kind of make it in Michigan, uh, who have seen in me the, the kind of person, the kind of temperament that they want to see in a jurist. Your safety is on the ballot for Supreme Court. Captain Andrew Fink or soft on crime Kim Thomas? Captain Andrew Fink, served as a Marine lawyer, knows the price of freedom. Andrew Fink for Supreme Court. Send in the Marine. Not terribly long ago, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. Was that a good decision, a wise decision? Were you proud of your United States Supreme Court when they came down with that decision? Well, it, it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting question because, you know, famously Roe versus Wade, the reasoning there was questioned even by somebody like Justice Ginsburg. Um, and so in, in some sense, it wasn't a surprise to see the, the Supreme Court uh, reverse that decision, not because of the particular outcome, uh, but because it, it was a case that had already drawn a lot of criticism, including from people who liked the outcome. As a, as a matter of state law, I'll just say that I don't think that the topic of a, of, a, of a given legal question really changes the approach that I would take, the judicial philosophy that I have of trying to read the law as, it, as it's written. And so, you know, the, the fact that abortion has become a hot button issue uh, at the state level because of the, that reversal uh, doesn't really impact how I look at the job. Um, and so I haven't really thought about it in that way. Election integrity is certainly something that's been under fire, particularly these last four years. Um, in your opinion, was President Biden the duly elected president of these United States? The ultimate question you're asking, 
He won the most electoral votes. That's how you become the president of the United States. So he, he became the president of the United States. That was the result of the election. Uh, the election integrity issues that, that people have brought up really aren't unique to 2020. I mean, things like whether our voter ID law is strong enough or whatever, these are issues that have been debated for you know, a long time and even the subject of court cases for a long time. Um, and so I, I, I think that anybody who is interested in election integrity issues shouldn't focus only on 2020, but should instead look at the long view and kind of what the best practices are and whether we're engaging in them now. Should there be financial transparency for Michigan Supreme Court justices? Well, I support it and in fact even gave a speech uh, in support of the first financial transparency legislation affecting legislators. Um, I think that uh, something comparable uh, for judges is reasonable. So I think uh, putting people at ease about whether there's any kind of a bias based on personal finances uh, for Supreme Court uh, justices, for judges in Michigan, is fine. I, I think it shouldn't come with sort of an assumption that there's something wrong going on. Uh, but uh, some amount of transparency certainly seems appropriate. As you look back on your career, what are you proudest of or what perhaps presented the greatest challenge to you that you want the viewers to know about? Look, I, it's in terms of the career that I've had, uh, I think the, the thing I'm most proud of is uh, having served as a Marine Legal Assistance Attorney for uh, something close to a year and a half, maybe a year and a quarter, something like that and helping a lot of Marines and sailors and their families uh, be prepared for a deployment. Uh, sorting out their, their legal issues, especially getting their state planning documents in order so that when those guys or gals went overseas, they were ready to focus on their mission uh, rather than be you know, worried about a car uh, back home that they uh, were trying to make payments on or uh, uh, their estate plan not being all set up. When they were able to bring those issues to me beforehand and we could help them be ready to be focused on the mission when they went overseas, that I think was the greatest contribution I've kind of made, again, in serving my neighbors uh, in my career. All right. Representative Fink, thanks so much for coming in, sharing your opinions and sharing your thoughts about why you want to become a Michigan Supreme Court Justice. Thanks very much for having me, I appreciate it. It's our pleasure. My thanks to all the Michigan Supreme Court candidates. We would like to point out that in the interest of fairness, all of the interviews were conducted prior to any of the programs being broadcast. That way, none of the four people running had an advantage over each other. You can find all of the candidate interviews on WXYZ.com under Spotlight on the News. I'm Chuck Stokes. Have a great week.